This is a video about the operation of multiple copies of my variable backflow flapgates, also known as VBFGs, operating in parallel. Replacing one or more flapgated culverts with multiple culverts that allow tidal exchange allows habitat restoration while preserving flood control benefits. This is a plan view of a number of openings in a flood wall. Each opening has a side hinge VBFG. The tidal side of the wall is above and the protected side is below the flood wall in this graphic. The flood tide is rising and water is flowing through the openings, filling some portion of the storage volume on the protected side of the flood wall. Wire rope and my proprietary tension regulators produce torsion, which hold each of the gates open. Adjustable stops control the position of the gate lease when they are fully open. As the flood tide progresses, the flow velocity increases due to the geometry of the storage prism on the protected side of the flood wall. As the water level rises, the incremental storage volume increases dramatically. My tide gate design uses the same principle that causes an airplane wing to generate lift. Energy along a streamline in a flow field is defined by the Bernoulli equation. As the square of the flow velocity increases, the pressure and or elevation must decrease. The water flowing faster on one side of the open gate leaf causes lift, or what I describe as a draft force, in the same way that air flowing faster on the top of a wing creates lift. This effect only applies to gate number one, since the other gates have roughly the same flow velocity on both sides of the gate leaves. While the gates are wide open, velocity v1 will be approximately equal to v2, hence there is no draft force drawing gate number 2 closed. As the flood tide progresses, at some point the increasing velocity and thus increasing draft force overpowers the tension regulator for gate number 1. The gate then closes with some resistance from the tension regulator. As the gate closes, it throttles the flow through opening number 1. The flow velocity approaching opening 2 is now greater than the flow velocity at opening number 1. This produces a draft force, which at some point overpowers the tension regulator for gate number two, and it begins to close. This dynamic is repeated sequentially for each of the remaining gate leaves until they are all closed. Any number of gates could be used. Here is an animation of what I call the domino effect. The time span from when the first gate begins to close until the last gate closes will normally be less than one minute. There are ways to make the gates close more slowly if desired. Note that there are some critical details that I am not disclosing in the interest of brevity and in the interest of protecting some fraction of my intellectual property. Here it is again. I've stopped the animation at a critical point in the process. Gate number one has closed enough to reduce the flow slightly. Gate number two begins to close at this point because the difference in the velocities is sufficient to generate enough of a draft force to overpower the tension regulator for gate number two. After all of the gates closed, the tide continues to rise and the seating head holds the gates closed. At some point during the falling ebb tide, the water levels on each side of the flood wall will be nearly equal. With no seating head, the closed gate leaves spring open. Since the tension regulator for gate number one is more powerful than the tension regulators for the other gates, it opens first and it opens faster. This is an animation showing what the gates look like as they spring open. Fish biologists who I have been in contact with in the past have told me that fish-friendly tide gates should open wide to maximize the probability that juvenile fish can pass through the open gates. The stop for gate number one is set so that the gate opens wider than the other gates. This allows the wide open gate to be restrained with less torque since the draft force is reduced. This also makes it easier for fish to find the opening and get past the open gate. Increasing the torque applied to gate number one will cause all of the gates to stay open longer during the flood tide. Reducing the torque for gate number one will cause the gates to close earlier. The tension regulator settings for gates two, three, four, etc. will only need to be changed if the closing water level is changed dramatically. Note that if all of the tension regulators are disconnected, the gates will open and close like normal flap gates that allow no backflow. Temporarily disabling backflow could be useful at times. This is a side view animation of a side hinge VBFG opening and closing with the ebbing and flooding tides. Multiple VBFGs can also be secured to a concrete headwall cast on the ends of HDPE culverts. One control mechanism effectively controls all of the gates. The control mechanism is simple to operate and for a given setting the gates will close consistently with uncanny reliability. This is a photo of me at Edison Slough in front of the VBFG control mechanism there. The control mechanism is simple and is tamper proof. There have been a number of attempts to design tide gates that allow some amount of backflow for fish passage. There are self-regulating tide gates, also known as SRTs, pet doors, fish flaps, guillotines, and other designs. Some are ridiculously complicated. Here are photos of a few of the more complicated designs. 
It's a small wonder that many people feel that good, fish-friendly tidegate designs simply do not exist. The people who came up with these designs thought they were state-of-the-art, and I suppose they are, like a Picasso. I presume that they all work to some degree, but there is nothing elegant about them. In contrast, my VBFG is an elegantly simple design for a flap gate that opens wide and allows backflow. This last design is known as a muted tidal regulator. During the design stage of the Nature Conservancy's Fisher Slough project, creating new wetlands for salmon, I was tasked with writing the specifications for the floodgates. I explained the physics of my variable backflow flap gate to Tetratech's project manager verbally and later in an email. He declined to even consider this design. Instead, he, Tetratech, the Nature Conservancy, and the 225 people from 15 organizations who were in contact with the project elected to go with the muted tidal regulator design. In 2011, on a web page, the Nature Conservancy referred to the tide gates at Fisher Slough as state-of-the-art floodgates. Tetratech is a major engineering consulting firm. In 2011, they had 13,000 employees and $2.6 billion in revenue. They deliver the best solutions to meet the client's needs using sound science, understanding, and innovation. You would have thought they'd love my idea for a tide gate. Based on Tetratech's description of our company, Decline was obviously not a good fit for Tetratech. Before the Fisher Slough project was finished, he jumped ship and went to work for an engineering firm named Shannon and Wilson. Shannon and Wilson received over a half million dollars of Recovery Act money for their role in the Fisher Slough debacle. Not bad. So what did the Nature Conservancy and President Obama get for their $5.7 billion investment in Fisher Slough? They got the Big Ditch Siphon. 60 acres of what will ultimately be a marsh filled with reed canary grass, and a state-of-the-art floodgate. In reality, the American taxpayers bought this. This is a time-lapse movie of the new muted tidal regulator floodgates at Fisher Slough. As you can see, the gates slowly creep open and closed with the falling and rising tides. The gates are rarely or never really wide open. This is less than ideal for passing juvenile salmon. In January of 2013, a report was published regarding the operation of the floodgate at Fisher Slough. These are entries from the logbook for the floodgate, and they were included in the appendix of this report. They tinkered with the flood control mechanism for the Fisher Slough gates on six dates within the span of one month. Setting the floodgate so that it closes at the target water level of 7.5 feet was done by trial and error. It took multiple attempts over a span of nine days to get the floodgate to close at the proper elevation. They raised the floodgate setting, then lowered it, then raised it, then raised it again. Setting my VBFG gate to close at the target elevation is simple, and it can be done with precision in a single iteration. On this graphic, I've circled all the dates that have entries in the Fisher Slough floodgate operation logs. There are 16 entries in one year. For contrast, I retrofitted the tide gate at Edison Slough with my VBFG control mechanism in January of 2009. If there was a logbook for the Edison Slough tide gate, it would have had exactly one entry. On July 8, 2012, three years later, I performed routine maintenance. I removed a small hornet's nest without getting stung. I replaced a short length of galvanized wire rope with stainless steel wire rope, and I checked the tension regulator for signs of wear. It was fine. All right, it's 2.55, less than an hour since I started. I've got everything back together. The maintenance is done. And in that less than an hour, I still had to deal with the hornet's nest in this thing. <laughs> Roughly one hour of operation and maintenance was required during three years. The gate operated flawlessly with no failures. Why does this matter? There are approximately 100,000 miles of levees in the United States. That's enough to go around the earth four times. All of these levees have tide gates and flap gated culverts. These water control devices degrade water quality and prevent fish and other aquatic organisms from accessing potentially valuable habitat. Tide gates and flap gates also have profound effects on the vegetation surrounding the affected watercourses. Invasive non-native plants frequently displace beneficial wetland plants, 
and the natural hydraulics are radically altered by tide gates and flap gates. For contrast, this is a photograph of the lush, salt-tolerant wetland plants upstream from my VBFG at Edison Slough. More importantly, traditional tide gates and flap gates create significant amounts of stagnant water in drainage ditches. This stagnant water can propagate mosquitoes as well as other vectors for disease. The stagnant water typically becomes choked with algae and aquatic plants such as Eurasian milfoil. These plants outcompete native plants and they clog the watercourses, significantly inhibiting drainage. When watercourses and drainage ditches are unable to carry runoff, the runoff spills onto the surrounding area, making shallow pools that can be used by mosquitoes. Poor drainage also inhibits crop growth. There is a viable, simple, yet elegant design for an environmentally friendly tide gate. The Variable Backfill Flap Gate by Jewel Tide Gates.